Hello and Happy New Year's, Brussels Sprouts listeners. I'm Andrea Kendall-Taylor. And I'm Jim Townsend. And we're so glad you can join us. Jim and I want to wish everyone a very happy new year. And to ring in the new year, we have an excellent lineup of episodes focused on the top issues and trends that are likely to shape 2024. And we thought there was no better place to start than with the war in Ukraine and how things are likely to play out this coming year. Many people are now characterizing the war in Ukraine as a stalemate. And while true that very little has changed along the front lines in the last several weeks and months, and it appears unlikely that either side has the capacity to make a major breakthrough, this label of a stalemate is misleading. Both Moscow and Kyiv are working to rebuild their offensive capacity and developments over 2024, things like each side's ability to access munitions, train their fighters, and the extent of the casualties they take will be critical in shaping the long-term trajectory of the conflict. So rather than a stalemate, 2024 is likely to be a decisive year in this conflict. And to discuss that and where things stand and where they could go, we're very happy to welcome back to the podcast, Mike Kaufman and Shawshank Yoshi. Mike and Shawshank, welcome back. Thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, thanks for having us back. Uh, Mike uh, is a senior fellow in the Russia and Eurasia program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, where he focuses on the Russian military and Eurasian security issues. And Shawshank is the defense editor at The Economist and a visiting fellow at the Department of War Studies at King's College London. Um, All right, Mike, let's start with you just to set the table. um, How would you describe this current state or this current phase of the conflict? Sure. Well, uh, I think the phase one is actually not too dissimilar from the phase we were in in uh, late 2022 heading into 2023, right? This is a transitional period. We're at the tail end of both the Ukraine offensive that culminated sometime maybe end of September and a Russian offensive that took place in the fall starting in October that also didn't achieve that much and seems to have culminated as well. Uh, the winter weather has set in, particularly in the earlier part of the winter, it makes it much harder to sustain offensive operations. So you're going to have much more attritional fighting, and you have fighting that's much more characterized by folks hanging on to static positions. And this is likely going to continue until a bit later into the winter. But the bottom line, at least my point of view, is, is that the, the war is not, is not a stalemate. It appears temporarily stalemate, and you have phases like this, and you have had phases like this several times in the war, right? And you have to be careful not to interpret the specific period of, of the war that you're in, that you're observing, you know, let's say two, three months, for the, the overall situation. I don't think that there's a durable or stable stalemate in place, or at least that's fair to interpret that way. I think it's far too early to make that call. Um, you know, beyond that, I do think it's fair to to say that Russia holds a lot of the material advantages heading uh, into 2024, and I'm happy to talk more about that. I don't think they're they're necessarily decisive or deterministic, but it's very clear that 2024 is going to be a difficult year for Ukraine, and that Ukraine's opportunities are going to be constrained in 2024. The the West, as best I can tell does not have the resources for another major offensive operation like what we saw in 2023 or even the offensives that we saw in the fall of 2022. And it's important to set that as the baseline uh, for what we should expect in in this year. Uh, That said, Ukraine also has options and opportunities, but a lot depends on the extent of support it gets from Western countries and and the role they choose to play. So I'll I'll leave it at that as kind of an opening opening comments or or answer to your question. Yeah, really, just a quick follow-up. I mean, it's pretty clear from recent Putin statement speeches, et cetera, that he's feeling quite confident. I mean, it's kind of hard to miss his self-assurance in his ability to accomplish uh, his goals in Ukraine. So I know um, we all, well, Russia watchers always love this question, but like if you are in Putin's head, you know, what is he thinking when he looks at what's happening in Ukraine? Um, A, have his objectives changed? B, what do you think he's trying to accomplish in the short term? And then, yeah, I mean, just, you know, what's your sense of how he sees things going? Sure. So I don't think Russia's objectives have changed. And I don't take very much seriously this reporting of them reaching out, wanting to negotiate. Russia's actually in a more advantageous position right now. They don't really have a reason to negotiate. I I think negotiation 
for Moscow is really a a discussion of Ukraine and the West uh, of Ukraine's and the West capitulation in practice. Um, I know some people debate that, but it's very difficult to take seriously or in earnest a Russian desire to negotiate, given the, both their objectives, which remain fairly maximalist, and where we are in the war. Second, I think it's clear that Russian leadership believes they survived the worst that the West and Ukraine could throw at them in this offensive. The offensive didn't achieve its objectives, and it was Ukraine's sort of best window of opportunity to deal Russia a decisive defeat in the war. And it didn't pan out. The offensive failed. So I think now they're confident, but I also believe, and this is me speaking of someone who's been following Russian Russian military for quite a few years, that they are um, stereotypically overconfident because Russia has a host of their own structural problems. And when looking at their war effort, it's not clear that they have the means to achieve their political objectives at all. They've had a fundamental mismatch between means and desired political ends since the outset of the war, uh, to some extent. And and also, it it really depends on what happens in this coming year, because there's a fair chance that by 2025, um, Russia will be facing uncertainty and could be presented with pretty significant dilemmas in this war, depending on what the West choose to do and what Ukraine choose to do. Meaning, meaning they they're advantaged, but they're not winning, and and they far from won it. That to put it to put it that way. Uh, so. It's clear to me that they believe, given the amount of money they're spending, if you look at particularly the budget this year, I mean, they're spending more as a share of GDP and as a share of government spending on defense than pretty much uh, they spent since the collapse of the Soviet Union. And and they're clearly thinking or hoping that that this is going to be the year when they start winning and start generating momentum. My my understanding is that the Ru- Russia has a three-year plan, that they, they expect to... They think they're going to win this war, you know, sometime by 2026. The challenge is that the, the picture can can begin to look a lot better for Ukraine and for Western ability to support Ukraine by 2025, right? So actually, while this year that we're in right now is going to be a rather difficult one, the material advantage is stacked on the Russian side. You know, uh, war is very much an uncertain business, and... Uh, I'm loath to make predictions on it. Uh, I've certainly made made some before that have been wrong. And and uh, what I'll tell you is that it's very hard to see out more than a couple months into a, into a conflict, and and even much harder looking a year or two into this war. So I think that the um, that the Russian confidence is probably overconfidence, and and they're trying to project confidence as much as they can. Whereas in reality, they have a lot of structural issues, both from an economic perspective and from uh, just their basic capacity to attain their objectives in this war, if you look out over the next two, three years. Shashank, I want to juxtapose maybe where Putin's mindset is with um, Zelensky's and knowing that you just had the opportunity to interview him. Um, Can you share a little bit about your uh, understanding or your perceptions of of where his mood, where his attitude, where like how he sees things going in this conflict. Of course, um, we I was lucky enough to interview Zelensky alongside several colleagues um, just a few just a few days ago, and we've published that on the Economist website. What struck me was how um, angry he was, uh, frustrated, angry. He has lost some of that lightness and charisma of the earlier days, I guess, as you would expect for a leader who is now entering into his uh, third year of a major a major war in which his partners are going through m- hugely consequential elections in the months ahead. Um, and despite us inviting him on a number of occasions to try to spell out or articulate a sense of a strategy or a plan, you know, what is his plan for Crimea? What's his plan for the Black Sea? What's his plan B in the event that American military aid ruptures? Um, I I got the sense that he he was he he was he didn't have very much to say on those questions, which worries me. And I'm additionally worried that he has not found the right way to communicate with some of his international partners. Uh, you know, the 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 easy communication of the first years in which Ukraine's cause was almost unquestioned and self-evident, that's passed. And I think he has is, is is struggling to find a way to talk to Americans in ways that addresses the political funk that we're in. 
Now, with that said, I did want to add a couple of points to, to Mike's opening survey and just say, first of all, on the question of stalemate, I think it's worth reflecting on the fact we don't necessarily know when we're in a stalemate, when you're in when you're inside one, right? It, it, these things can sometimes only be retrospectively defined. Um, it, 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 it may take us a while to kind of truly figure how sticky the situation is. Um, the two big dynamics that we haven't really touched on yet are, first of all, the, the Black Sea campaign. And as the ground war begins to look more positional and static, uh, and both sides struggle to achieve any kind of breakthrough, Ukraine's military ambitions in the Black Sea are going to be much, much more important. And I think that that, uh, including Crimea particularly, is going to be an extremely significant part of their campaign in the next several months. We can say more about that. The other one on the Russian side is the aerial campaign. We've seen increasingly heavy airstrikes on Kiev and other cities, including, I think, about a week since we were speaking here, um, the heaviest airstrikes on Kiev since the very first day of this war. And I think that's another that's another dynamic to this campaign that's going to be very important for the next month. And the final thing I'll just mention is, um, whilst it's absolutely right that we identify Ukraine's structural weaknesses, the fact that it's being vastly outgunned um, on in terms of artillery, the fact that it faces a huge shortage of spare parts for its armored vehicles, uh, it needs a huge number of artillery barrels. I think Mike is completely right to highlight that the Russian side has certain weaknesses as well. And the one I just want to pick up on um, before I shut up is the Russian economy. Um, the Russian economy is a really interesting question. The Russians, the one difference between the end of 2022 and today, Mike, Mike drew that comparison, is that the Russian war economy is more mature at this stage than it was a year ago. Um, but there are signs of difficulties for the Russians as well. You know, the stimulus they have injected into their economy is equivalent to about 5% of GDP last year. That's a, a bigger boost than they implemented during the pandemic. But their supply constraints can't take that. And so we're seeing pretty significant inflation, uh, very low unemployment that's causing you know, a, 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 um, an exacerbation of that inflation. And I think that these problems could mount for the Russians over the next year as well. So let's not assume they simply have limitless resources to grind this out in a way that leaves the Ukrainians helpless. Well, uh, it's great to see you guys uh, in the new year. Thank you so much for being our first guests on uh, on Brussels sprouts. Uh, there's no better way to start the new year than with you two. So thanks for, for being here. Uh, let me ask a question about the West. I mean, Shawshank, you mentioned there were, that there was hard to get any kind of idea about a plan B in your, in your talks uh, with uh, Zelensky. What should the West's plan B be uh, for this year? In other words, plan A for the West last year was uh, just providing assistance, trying to develop a training program, a uh, limited one, uh, going through the gymnastics of what kind of weaponry and this type of thing. And I think we ended last year with a feeling that not enough was done uh, quickly enough with the right kinds of weaponry. There was still this hesitation, this fear of escalation. Uh, the training, uh, there's a lot of talk about how the training didn't really match up with what the mission needed to be. There were problems with the way the West approached uh, assisting Ukraine and particularly in the United States. So as as the West looks at looks at this new year coming up, what should we do differently now based on what we've learned about last year and where the battlefield sits now? What should we be doing differently, both in terms of the United States as well as the West generally? Shawshank, why don't you jump first? Well, I would just say that, first of all, um, we should think about options that don't revolve around additional funding, high levels of military aid. Of course, Ukraine needs uh, needs needs aid, it needs shells, it needs spare parts, it needs all of those things. But I think if we reflect on what went wrong in 2023, what went wrong with the plan A, you know, th this could be the subject of hours of discussion. But I think it's increasingly clear that the way we trained and prepared the Ukrainian force for the counteroffensive that began in June um, was deeply problematic for the conditions that they faced. And it does not require breaking the deadlock in Congress. It does not require Europeans to suddenly triple defense spending to be able to come up with a more coherent and effective package of scaled up training. Uh, I know Mike has written on this. He wrote a great essay with Rob Lee. Uh, Jack Watling has just written a little bit on this for foreign affairs as well. And clearly one of the issues is the length of training for some of the combined arms training the Ukrainians received. 
But another aspect is the realism of that training, the effectiveness of that training in preparing Ukrainian units for the conditions that they faced of perpetual ubiquitous aerial surveillance and, and Russian, Russian loitering munition attack. And the third aspect um, uh, is, of course, staff training, right? You have a hugely expanded Ukrainian army, which has really not expanded the number of staff officers to the same degree. And that lack of staff capacity clearly had a direct effect on the offensive operations of the last six months. And to my mind, and, and Mike can, can correct me or can, can, can tweak my answer if, if, I, if I'm mistaken here, fixing that does not necessarily require us to come up with tens and tens of uh, or hunt, uh, dozens of billions of dollars in cash. Mike. Sure. Uh, and Shashi is absolutely right. Um, let me talk briefly about training and industrial capacity and maintenance of so things we need to do a bit differently. Uh, so it was very clear from what happened in the offensive that first, there's just not enough time. I'm going to break a secret to you. You cannot make a brigade in four months anywhere in this world. And it's just not enough time, first and foremost. The two areas where training really need to get fixed, as Shawshank pointed out, was unit cohesion, the ability to operate as a unit. On an Excel spreadsheet, you may have a brigade, and you have people that are trained uh, individually in their tasks and have had basic training, but they cannot operate as a company or as a battalion, and a brigade staff is not effectively trained to, to employ them as well. You simply cannot do these things in four months. That's just the reality. You know? Mike, can like I if ask, I told... you know, was, was, there, was it the political imperative to, to start the, the counteroffensive that led them to go too soon? Or what, I mean, do you have an understanding of what that decision-making looked like? I mean, why uh, is it that they didn't give it more time? Washington Post has a lengthy expose, a two-part expose that I encourage everybody to read that came out in December about the various machinations and back and forth. But my general impression is that it was a surge effort. We got about it a bit late because, remember, it's it's a unified effort between the U.S. and its allies. It's not like the United States alone trained all the Ukrainian forces to provide all the equipment. If you look at the roster, there's a lot of countries. And as Jim will know, when you have to work with a lot of allies and corral this whole effort together, it takes time. They don't provide everything at the same level. Like we, the United States, trained two brigades, 47th and 82nd, right? Somebody else trained another brigade. Somebody else Poles trained a brigade. Somebody else trained two other brigades and so on and so forth. They didn't all get the same level of training at the same national level training center somewhere in Germany or on the same equipment or in the same way, just to be a public. When people hear training, I think what they imagine is that there's some one coherent, consistent program of one country. Usually they think it's the United States if they're Americans talking about it, that did this thing. That is not what took place. All right. Second, as I said, there was an imperative because the longer the delay, the more Russian forces were arrested and entrenched. And the United States is actually pushing Ukraine to go sooner. And they're, they're clear that on the Ukrainian side, they uh, they they need more time to get equipment to get things sorted in May and end up going in June. I ultimately don't think that that mattered that much based on what actually happened in the offensive. My own view, and this is based from from some experience in field work, is that in the end this was not deterministic, and that month month and a half is not what made the difference. Um, but but let me talk a bit more about training. The other big part is one: we need to localize training to Ukraine. We need to significantly expand basic training in Ukraine, which can be done. But to do that. Ukraine also needs to meet the West by solving their mobilization issues. Okay, They need quantity and they need quality and they need to replenish the force. Second, they need to pursue a strategy to actually freeze up their forces. One of the biggest caps on training, if you ask people why is the training program, let's say, capped to five weeks, because that's how long the West can get a Ukrainian battalion for. That's how long they'll release it for, right? So we cannot do longer training or scale up training if we cannot get those Ukrainian units off the line to actually do it, right? That's the other part. So. Next year, to me, very much needs to be focused as a build year, right? And the three parts of that have to be, you know, part of it is about entrenching so Ukraine can consolidate and hold what they had and address its force management issues. Free up units, enable rotation of units, have a place to rotate those units to scale up training and, and better rationalize the force. That also means getting a lot of help with maintenance and equipment. And, and Ukraine can do a lot more in country now uh, than it could compared to 2022 and 2023. But the other area where the West really needs to help is with industrial capacity, right? Like Ukraine is behind the curve in drone production, and it could easily have parity with Russia with Western assistance. Ukraine can uh, do a lot to maintain Western equipment and to build entirely new components for Western equipment if it had uh, help in industrial capacity. Um, 
There's a lot more we can do, I think, if we had a modicum of greater presence there in terms of training, in terms of maintenance and advising, not a lot, but a bit, right? And, you know, you've heard me say this before. I'm not talking about in terms of boots on the ground, but, you yeah, know, we're, we're heading into a third year of the war where we're trying to engage in a sort of pretzel policy where it's sort of Ukraine's war, but we're an, an essential material component and integral to the fight, right? And and a lot needs to. I think there needs to be greater presence from from Western countries in order in order to help Ukraine in the coming year. So so to me, you know, the the strategy would have to involve a a part that's very much focused on holding and consolidating, on rebuilding U Ukrainian capacity and combat effectiveness, and that's both industrial capacity and the force itself. And then also another el element of it that would have to involve. Uh, you know, strikes and, and things that, that suppress Russian capability. Shawshank talked about that. I just want to make two comments. I think what's happening in the Black Sea is very important. It's important for the economy, for Ukraine's economy. And that was the one uh, bright spot or air of success Ukraine had in 2023. And I think Crimea is definitely seen as an area point of vulnerability for Russia and something Ukraine can leverage over the coming year. But the one thing that I want to convey clearly is that in the West, just as you know, we are dominated by a maneuver school of thought, which had a very hard time um, in 2023 against, against the prepared defense, there's also this notion that the deep battle can substitute for actual major offensive. And the answer is it cannot, right? So there's no way I see that Ukraine can achieve those objectives if we do not rebuild the capacity for another major operation by 2025, right? With missiles and drones alone, like Ukraine is not going to take Crimea, right? It can create a lot of problems and a lot of dilemmas for Russian forces, and it can negate some of the Russian advantages. But just to be blunt, because there's always, you know, there's always folks that come out and say, look, if we just get within range, the range ring, you know, we can take out the bridge and then and then everything will collapse. And the answer is no, it won't. It's, it's not, there isn't, this is a large scale conventional war. There isn't one easy, simple solution to this war. Like be wary of this, of this line of thinking that there's gonna be a silver bullet and I'm sure you've heard this over the last two years already. So, um, so the last point is that, yeah, well, well, a major window of opportunity was missed, I think, in 2023. It's important for folks to appreciate that it can be rebuilt, right? That advantage can be remade looking towards 2025. Can you just talk, I know, Jim, you want to jump into, but what does that picture that you just described, our ability to do those things for Ukraine and Ukraine's prospects in 2024, what, what does that look like in the absence of U.S. aid that's being held up in Congress? I mean, what is Ukraine's ability to get through 2024? I mean, we hear all the stories about them having to husband resources and that the ratio of what they're able to fire relative to Russia has plummeted. Um, so what does it look like in 2024 if the U.S. aid doesn't come through and, 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 and they're not able to at least maintain some pressure on the Russians across the front line? Because I think that'll be a big issue that would allow Russia to rebuild more quickly, train its forces, rotate off the line, et cetera, et cetera. So if they not only do they have to hold the line, but in some places they need some sort of offensive capacity to keep pressure on Russia. And can they do that absent the U.S. assistance? Uh, Andrea, the short answer is not good. So Ukraine will, uh, will not collapse, but it will start losing the war. Right. U.S. material assistance cannot easily be substituted for by Europeans. Ukraine has basic requirements of artillery ammunition, air defense interceptors, and other things just to sustain a defensive posture. Okay. If that funding doesn't get passed, and if the United States doesn't find a way to sustain Ukraine's war effort, which would be very difficult without that funding, as best as I understand it, then the Russian advantage will mount, and will mount significantly in 2024. And Ukraine will begin losing. It's it's very much that stark of a choice. There isn't sort of U U.S. funding goes away, and this thing just kind of settles into a stalemate, and then the war freezes itself. No, no, that's not that's not the direction it begins to head. I just want to be clear about that. Shawshank, what do you want to add? Um, Mike, are you saying that fourteen British Challenger two tanks are not going to have a decisive effect on the front lines? I'm I'm shocked and disappointed to hear this. But what I was actually going to say was just to give it a more tangible, uh, put a more tangible number on this. There was a very interesting paper I, I commend to everyone published by the Estonian Ministry of Defence 
in December that was uh, whose aim was to sort of set out the the basis of a a way of thinking about next year, a strategy for next year. And you can agree or disagree with lots of it, but it was a a systematic, rigorous, and thoughtful effort to try to look at what a successful pathway looks like. And it said that um, if you want to stop Russia from regaining offensive capacity in a serious way, um, you know they can train about 130,000 troops into cohered units every six months. And the Estonians said the objective then has to be to inflict a sustained rate of attrition of at least 50,000 killed and severely wounded every six months on Russia, if you want to prevent offensive capacity. That's the, obviously, you have to do other things as well. Now, to, to me, if you look at a world in which American shells are absent from the battlefield, in which American aid it, it, it dwindles and, and effectively dries up, and Europeans have to do that, it looks to me impossible that Ukraine can sustain that level of attrition on a sustained basis. And the results may not be felt you know, right away. They may take until 2025 before that offensive potential is felt again. But I agree with Mike that it will be felt and it won't look good for Ukraine. Well, I, I agree with, with both of you. And just to make the point that um, if people think that uh, this war is going to uh, become a, a frozen conflict, uh, like we've seen after 2014, they're absolutely wrong. Uh, Russia has no intent to allow this to be a frozen conflict. They're in to win this, not to get locked into something that they've had to deal with since 2014. So this idea that we'll just, you know, we'll just muddle, the Ukraine will just muddle through until it's a frozen conflict and we go back to business as usual, that's not what Moscow has in mind. And they're building towards that that ability to make sure that that's not what happens. Yeah, that's why that stalemate term I think is so damaging. But yeah, I, I agree. No, I agree. I think people people shouldn't think that we're going to just uh, default back into a business as usual post twenty fourteen. That's just not going to happen. But let me let me ask you all something. Having been a denizen of the Pentagon for many many years of conflict, um, it is starting to smell a little bit like what happened after we invaded Iraq. Uh, we were already in Afghanistan. That was a major push for us. Uh, we invade Iraq, and pretty soon, because of all the issues coming out of Iraq, all eyes focused there and away from Afghanistan. Afghanistan became the, the forgotten war. I saw it in, in, with my own eyes uh, as as bandwidth and political attention focused on dealing with the with the wildfire burning in Iraq. I'm starting to get a feeling that uh, Ukraine is heading in that direction a bit in terms of Washington and the White House as in this new year, they're dealing with the Middle East that is that is close, quickly reaching a boiling point, uh, as as we have seen. Uh, I, Blinken is going over there again over the next day or so. Uh, he's, he seems to be there all the time. There's a lot of focus and a lot of bandwidth on the Middle East. During a presidential election year, when there's when that bandwidth is full of politics, even on a good day, so do you feel that we're going to be entering into a, a potential where during the course of this year, uh, Afghan um, Afghanistan um, Ukraine is on the back burner uh, as a White House attention is going to be focused increasingly on dealing with the boiling pot of the Middle East uh, and the presidential election. Uh, and Ukraine becomes like Afghanistan was a few years into our invasion of Iraq. Shawshank, you want to start? You've got your finger yeah, on the pulse. I think and that I, 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 I think that um, you know how limited policy bandwidth can be for a start, and we've seen you know the absolutely intense pace of shuttle diplomacy uh, right now being undertaken by Secretary Blinken and and and, and others. Uh, the huge naval buildup in in the Mediterranean. We're on the cusp, I think, of airstrikes against the Houthis in Yemen. I think that's probably quite likely at this stage. That's going to suck up even more Pentagon attention for for quite a while to come. And the northern front in Israel, the Lebanon front, is looking extremely tense right now as well. And all of that is sucking the oxygen out the room. Um, the weapons trade off is not necessarily acute right now. Of course, Israel is uh, taking some U.S. one fifty five millimeter artillery. There's also the question of Patriot interceptors that are that are um, uh, much in demand from Ukraine as well as the Russians ramp up their winter strike campaign on Ukrainian cities. But I think the biggest problem is is public attention. You know, if you look at the polls, and I know a lot of European governments who are doing private polls of their own electorates trying to understand this issue. The, the funny thing is, support for Ukraine is steady and high. 
th th there's no crisis. There is no real war fatigue in that sense. What there is, is a tailing off in levels of interest, a waning level of interest in the conflict, which makes it harder to sustain the public basis for generating the budgets, the funds to invest in things like reopening production lines, allocating munition stockpiles for Ukraine, uh, and, and making big public interventions when they're needed. So the, the problem here is not that people are turning against Ukraine. It's simply that they are fatigued and that they are losing uh, a, a focus and attention on the Ukraine conflict. Mike? Well, I think Josh gave gave a good answer to that subject. I mean, I, I, I don't know what to say here, except that I think, to me, the quintessential challenge right now is once that funds have ended, to lay out a long-term strategy and vision, right? That's the real issue. And I was arguing this before the offensive back in the spring, in, in the piece beyond the offensive with Rob Lee, basically saying that the offensive wasn't going to resolve the war and that the West needed a long-term strategy, needed to accept that this was going to be a long war, and needed to come up with a plan that, that shows thinking beyond the next six months, because we were principally thinking in six-month cycles before, before the right. winter. And right. now the conversation needs to be, what does the next 18 months look like? Which doesn't sound epically long-term, but for Washington, D.C., and for the Pentagon, it is actually. <laughs> in a war, 18 months is actually pretty pretty, pretty long-term thinking. So my, my sense of it is that uh, we're we're now in a place where where we have to lay out a vision, a strategy for how we're going to rebuild the advantage. What are we rebuilding towards? What does success look like? And then how to and how to effectively make those investments to resource it. Um, there's and, and I, I think this discussion is taking place right now, and it's intertwined with both the conversation in Congress, which is, okay, White House, you would like the money. What are we giving this money towards? Can you lay out your strategy and vision? I personally, I actually don't think as the United States, we've done a good job of it. I think we should have been in the lead having that conversation in November when it was very clear that the offensive had culminated. Right? And, and even when Zaluzhli had... Uh, in his interview in The Economist, which Shawshank, uh, uh, Shawshank's publication published, uh, made clear that there was going to be no break with the offensive, that it was it was uh, discussed it as a stalemate situation. That was the point to come out with that. And, and I think we're still not there yet. We're not making great case. The Estonian paper, I think, lays out a good vision. I have a lot of agreements with it, though I don't particularly care for those numbers. Um, and I also don't like, I'm not a fan of McNamara's thinking. It could produce a trip, 50,000 Russian troops in X number of months. Yeah, I've heard this story before in other wars. It's not the Iraq war. There are other wars where this line of thinking wasn't particularly successful. So I would I would think of it a little differently than that. Um, but overall, I I like the the kind of the thrust. And it's very telling, I think, that Estonian colleagues have leaned forward with a vision of what a strategy could look like. And we've not seen documents of this type come out from the United States. Right. Right. Um, so I'll, I'll just leave it at that. And it's not for a lack of people here that, that have ideas of what strategy should be or 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 um, or lack of folks involved in the conversation. I just think it's very telling that Estonians have come out with these discussion. And I think it would have been great to see something like that uh, uh, from ourselves. Well, I'm feeling depressed by the conversation, and I guess maybe this wasn't the best way to kick off the new year. But just to rewind just a teeny bit, I mean, you know, let's do worst case assumption planning that the, the uh, funding doesn't come through from the United States. And we've talked about, I mean, you both have made the case for why that's so consequential. But talk a little bit more specifically then about what you think the Russian side could feasibly accomplish in the absence of that funding. So what are we talking about? Are they going to make it to Kiev? I mean, what, you know, you, you both talked about that there are structural problems on the Russian side, that they have a case a little bit of perhaps being overly confident. So if, you know, what would be your best guess of how, of, of what they would be looking to accomplish in 2024? particularly if the funding from the United States doesn't come through? I would I would be surprised if they were able to meet even their minimal objectives of liberating uh, slash uh, conquering the remainder of the Donbass, in practice, of course, the remainder of Donetsk province, by the end of the year, 
even in a situation where aid tails off. Because, of course, you know, we, it, it, it's not as if the Ukrainians uh, have nothing or, or, you know, it'll be nothing in hand at all. Um, and that's why I retain this kind of residual sense of, you could call it optimism, at a world in which um, we don't see a Trump victory later this year, in which the Russian side then has to ask themselves very hard, are we prepared for another four years of this, another four years of attrition, another four years of a war economy in which the civilian sector is starved, mm -hmm. another four years of um, a Biden administration or a Democratic administration that, however half-heartedly, is willing to keep the Ukrainians in the game and maybe re-energized at the NATO summit in the summer, uh, realizing the stakes ahead of them. Um, and I'm not saying that they throw their hands up and say, OK, we'll talk or OK, we're out of this. But their own theory of victory is then substantially challenged. Um, and, and I suppose that's the good news, isn't it? Right. That, that um, even if the Russians begin to get something of an edge, that doesn't translate into a collapse of Ukrainian lines. Agree, disagree? Yeah, so I'm a bit less optimistic here. Uh, first, I think that Russian leadership is definitely committed to this war and that they've significantly online defense industrial production, uh, repair of equipment. They have structural manpower issues, but they are getting assistance from North Korea and from uh, Iran and ammunition, which is actually quite significant. In some ways, it's more significant than what Ukraine has seen from Europeans. Uh, I don't think that Russia can achieve its maximalist objectives in this war. You know, obviously, we're not. I don't think we're going to see Russian troops back in Kiev or anything like that. But that's not the point. There are two. There are two issues at play. Whether Russia achieves its minimal territorial objectives and stakes at Donbass, I think it's definitely possible if U.S. funding collapses. I mean, I don't quite understand the theory of, of how Ukraine sustains the war. What people need to appreciate is Ukraine has a monthly bill. Let's put it at 90,000 artillery shells. Right now, it's not getting that. Right now, it's getting less than that. It's probably getting maybe, maybe 60 or 70,000. The United States provides the overwhelming majority of that ammunition. I mean, overwhelming. OK, so imagine that just starts to go away. Then what? Same same story with air defense interceptors, too. So in the Russian strike campaign, as Russia increases production of missiles and drones, starts to affect critical infrastructure in Ukraine more and more. Maybe not this winter, maybe the next winter. Right. Ukraine is not territory. A country is its people. It's its economy. Right. It's it's. Um, uh, that that that's what makes uh, a nation at the end of the day. And so the challenge is Ukraine then begins to lose. And then the war ends in a way, and there's no way to predict how it will actually end, right? Military analysis is not kind of like fortune telling with, with, a, with a crystal ball. But the war ends in the way that Russia imposes its will on Ukraine. Ukraine is defeated and, and the West is too, because our stakes in this war were very high and we made them so, right? That's, that's a dark scenario. It's not necessarily how how things can go, but it's important to raise this and to make it clear to people that that's what's at stake when it comes to funding. I'm not doing this for the sake of advocacy, right? But I can see three trajectories, right? One, a positive trajectory. The right decisions are made this year. The right lessons are taken from 2023. This year is used to rebuild Ukraine's advantage and to exhaust the Russian armed forces at the peak of Russian defense spending. I think that's very possible, right? That's a realistic scenario. It can be achieved. Um, it's not a leap of faith. It can be done. Right. Another scenario that's a middling scenario where this doesn't work out and this, this becomes a grinding attritional fight. And by 2025, we do increasingly begin to see it as a stalemate. But as I've said before, Russian defeat is not the same thing as victory for Ukraine. Right. If this is a stalemate, it is not a victory for Ukraine in the West. And you will not be able to sell the talking point that this is a strategic failure for Russia. I'm sorry. It's already increasingly in 2024, not a very good talking point, to be honest. And the more I've I, I saw some pretty bad spin coming out uh, in the last month as things got gloomy about Russian casualties and this and that. And I don't think it's helpful to, to be pushing us out there, just being being very honest from where we're in the front. Yeah, and the third scenario, and, and this scenario is also realistic, that Ukraine could start losing the war because we're not in some stable or durable stalemate, as I said earlier. So I'm, I don't think that Russia can achieve its maximalist objectives. But I'm a bit more pessimistic about how this goes. Russian advantage will then mount from 2024 into 2025. And uh, the, the situation on the political side in the West is obviously unpredictable. We have a host of elections this year. 
and we don't know what that's going to bring for Ukraine. But one thing that's increasingly clear is that Ukraine is likely to get less and less funding and resources, uh, most likely in 2025, than it did in 2024. I don't know if Shashank disagrees with me. I don't know if you disagree with me on that. But I think, despite a bipartisan congressional consensus to help support Ukraine, the what I see is a vocal minority that's that's coming up the works that's that's opposing this, and it grows in influence and power. And I think Ukraine is likely to get fewer resources. Mike, I agree with I agree with that last point. My only um, addition would be to say though that the resource intensity of a of a defensive campaign will also be will also be less than the demands of the offensive campaign they were forced to mount this year. Yeah, um, definitely. And, and and the thing is that that's those resources are meetable. That is, we can we can provide those over time. But uh, but if you take the United States out of the equation, Europeans are not in the position to provide those resources in 2024. I and guess the may not be in 2025. The, the wild card would be if suddenly nations agree to provide the frozen Russian funds to Ukraine uh, to use. That's a significant shot in the arm. If politically everyone and legally, I guess everyone can agree that's what they need to do. That's kind of a wild card in terms of possible funding in the future. Yeah, it is. Uh, but it would help Ukraine a lot sustain the economy and to make up for U.S. economic assistance, which is the way I think people are thinking of it, to be very clear. But so folks understand Money is not convertible, just convertible into artillery shells. You, there isn't a transmutation device where you have billions of dollars and then and then literally right after that, your production capacity has increased 500%. So that takes considerable time. And as we've seen from, from our own efforts and European efforts, you can have all the money in the world, but it takes time to online uh, industrial capacity and to actually to, 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 trans, to turn that into a uh, real output. Yeah, I mean, and the other point is on the economic aid, Mike, which you were just making. I mean, that's also crucially important. And it's plausible, you know, with uh, Orban blocking the 50 billion of EU economic assistance, if the United States isn't able to get its act together, um, things start to crumble even behind the front line as Ukraine can't pay for to pay its soldiers and, and to keep the economy running behind the front line. So that's also, you know, an equally dire um, picture, although we've been focused on the military side. I guess last question, and I and I don't know, just to drive the point home in terms of the importance of the aid and support for Ukraine. Um, we talked about, Mike, you laid out the three scenarios and in your worst case scenario where, you know, Russia is able to have a, a significant advantage over Ukraine and eventually impose its will on the country, what 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 then? I mean, actually, what does that mean? And I guess, you know, you heard President Biden when he talked to Congress talking about, well, if Putin, you know, has his way in Ukraine, he doesn't stop there. Secretary General Stoltenberg in, I think, December also made similar comments. I guess, you may, maybe Mike, starting with you, I mean, how, how much stock do you put into that? I mean, you hear it certainly a lot from the Baltics and others that if we don't stop Putin in Ukraine, then he could turn his you know, reorient this war uh, time footing in the direction of NATO and other European countries? I mean, how, do, how much stock do you put in that? Is that a real risk? I mean, to be honest, I actually think it's a better question for Shashank to go first because he, he got into this conversation yesterday online, I saw a bit. But here's my view of it. Um, I, I think no matter what, Russia's made structural changes to the economy and is uh, essentially switch to more of a wartime economy with defense industrial production mobilization of that effort is now a major driver of economic growth, right? That's not going to change, even if the war ends one way or another in the near term. So you're going to see Russia working focused on rebuilding military capability and restoring its military power over the next 10 years. And it's going to be probably working at a much faster rate than it previously had been at the rate of spending. I'm not talking about the rate of spending that they're that they're going to have the year, but a much higher percentage of the efforts going to be spent on that in the coming years, one way or another. So no matter how the war unfolds, Russia will be a problem and, and will be a threat. And certainly these other countries will see it as such. Now, the next question is, of course, you have two different futures. Um, uh, a much better future is one where uh, Russia's ambitions are thwarted and Russia is effectively defeated in Ukraine. Right? We can talk about what that looks like. But a much worse one is where the war ends in such a way 
The Russian leadership believes that it effectively exhausted and outlasted NATO, and Russians see this very much as not a Russia-Ukraine war, but a, a Russian war against the United States and NATO countries, because uh, external material assistance to Ukraine has been a critical part of the effort. And Russia is then actively rebuilding its military capacity over the span of several years. Uh, I don't think that you know, after Ukraine, Russia then turns around and says, well, we're going to invade Poland or we're going to invade the Baltics, right? But here's the important thing. This is not a useful line of thinking. Nobody in defense planning can afford to just uh, make assumptions about intentions. The capabilities are there. Intentions can change. Uh, Ukraine's own attempt to deter Russia failed. And Ukraine started the war with about 28 maneuver brigades and a lot of military capability. So most Baltic countries start the war with two brigades and whatever NATO could provide in a short notice contingency, which is not 28 brigades, right? Just be very clear about that. Um, they also do not have the geographic depth of Ukraine, the largest country in Europe with 600,000 square kilometers. So there's, most countries cannot afford to have an invasion where Russians occupy this amount of territory because for a country like Estonia, it would be double the total territory that they have. Right. So if you're looking at what happened in Ukraine and you're saying this is a success story, I'm going to tell you the truth. A lot of people I've talked to in parts of Europe do not see this as a success story. And they would like to see a much better uh, plan for how to deter Russia and how to defeat any potential Russian uh, military effort that looks that looks better and different than this. I hope that makes sense. So. So the way I look at it at the end of the day is I don't think it means that Russia then is going to just march on and try and invade a NATO country, but I think that you have a much more problematic Russia and a much more difficult deterrence challenge in Europe than, than you might have had. It's a debatable issue. Um uh, but but I but I think it's clear that if if the war in Ukraine ends in such a way where Russian leadership feels that they won, then we have a much bigger problem on our hand looking out in, in the coming decade or two. Shawshank, bring us home. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I'd say we've got to keep an eye on the NATO summit. And in a few, in a couple of months, in the spring, NATO is going to go to allies, having approved the big regional defense plans in Vilnius, at the Vilnius summit. And it will have a very difficult conversation with allies in which it will say, here's the plans you agreed to. Here's your current capability. Here's what you need in terms of logistics, deep strike, munition stockpiles, ground maneuver forces, air defense. And here's what it's going to cost. And at that point, assuming the uh, allied defense ministers and their chief heads of defense haven't keeled over from shock and turned very pale, um, they'll have some very tough decisions to make. Um, but the, the core point here is there's a line that says, um, you know, if if Russia prevails, whatever that means, um, the threat to Europe is heightened. And that's completely true. But my concern is that we haven't fully taken on board the fact that even if Russia does not prevail and even if Ukraine wins, the threat that Russia poses doesn't evaporate. It doesn't go home and says, well, that was a nice contest. Let's pack up. Let's dismantle the war economy we built up over two years. And let's um, let's undo all the lessons we've learned. And by the way, that big Shahed factory will just dismantle it. We don't need that anymore. So the threat, in fact, in some ways, is, is augmented because Russia is no longer waging a ruinous war in Ukraine in which it's suffering astonishing levels of human and physical losses. Uh, and I think that that's what we don't fully understand. You know, we 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 need to support Ukraine not because it's um not because the failure to do so the 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 uh, Russian victory will leave you Russia you will leave Europe in a worse position, but because Europe's going to be in a dangerous position whatever the outcome, and it has to prepare for that. Yeah, it's such an important point. I mean, like the, the war really is such a driving justification for the Putin regime and everything it does. And it's hard to imagine that if things die down in Ukraine, just as you guys are saying, that somehow it all goes away. I mean, it, it yes, yeah, I think it's such an important point and I'm glad you both made it. If, if I could just follow up that real quick, I, I realize that we're at the very end of the hour uh, and I promise I won't go on and on, but Shawshank, just to build on what you said. So I spent years as a NATO defense planner. So I had to put together all of those requests through all the countries that we need this and this and this and this from you, et cetera, et cetera. And what happens is this, and this is critical for the future. What happens is this, those NATO requests go to the countries, to the ministers of defense, they check with their prime ministers. Instead of keeling over when they see the bill, uh, the ministers of defense say, OK, we can do this. No problem. And the nations will agree around the table at a defense ministerial. They're good to go. 
they do that because they know that this is going to take many years to put together. Uh, they will no longer be a minister and, 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 and their prime minister won't be around. So it's easier at the table to say, we're on board, we're on part of this team, we're going to do it, knowing that they themselves are not going to be responsible down the road to pay the bill. What NATO does is a year or two or three later, they go to the nations uh, and say, have you done what we requested three years ago? And they'll say, well, you know, we weren't able to do it. That government that agreed didn't realize that the budget, blah, 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 blah. So nations continually kick the can down the road and don't fulfill completely or even halfway what NATO asks. That's been what's happened in the past. That cannot be the case for the future because the past didn't have the kind of threat that we have now. The past didn't have the kind of requirements that NATO has now. And if nations act the way they have in the past and they just kind of kick the ball down the road, uh, lip service and, and knowing that that's going to be on the desk of somebody else, if that's what they're going to do, uh, then uh, NATO deterrence is going to be hollow. It'll be a paper bag. Uh, that is empty. And I tell you, that's probably what Putin is assuming is going to happen because he has watched this since 2000. He has watched NATO do this. So he's probably expecting that these plans look great, but they're not going to deter him because he feels nations at the end of the day will not put up what they've agreed to put up to put uh, meat on the bones of this uh, on these regional plans. I hate to say that, but 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 I would be, you know, you know, but blowing sunshine at all of you guys. Uh, if I said, yeah, yeah, just wait till all those NATO forces are on that front lines. To, for that to happen, there's going to have to be a lot of pressure put on these nations uh, to put up what NATO says they need to have. Well, this has been a really rosy first episode back in 2024. So thanks to all of you for uplifting. I'm sorry, our I'm sorry. I feel terrible. Maybe we I had a moment of optimism there with Shawshank and then Mike came in and then Jim came in and, and put that put that to rest. But I really appreciate uh, your time, your insights. Um, this has been a really excellent discussion, as always, um, and looking looking forward to checking back in in a couple of months. I'll do better next time, Andrea. I'm sorry. <laughs> we can all we can all aspire. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you for listening to another episode of Brussels Sprouts, brought to you by the Transatlantic Security Team at the Center for a New American Security. You can find all of our previous episodes wherever you get your podcasts. And please remember to rate and review Brussels Sprouts so that new listeners are able to find the show.